We're probably all quite familiar with the images of spinning wheels and the spindle from Sleeping Beauty, but how exactly does spinning show up in folklore, mythology and legend? Let's find out in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I'm going to apologise in advance in case you can hear any slightly strange noises in the background. The wind is blowing quite the gale outside and it's making a really, really weird noise next to me and there's not really anywhere else in the house that I can record where you can't hear the wind. So it may end up being either weird or atmospheric. We shall see. Now I hope that you are well and that everything's more or less ticking along all right for you even if it's not back to normal just yet. We are continuing with Make a Month here at Fabulous Folklore. This is our penultimate episode and we're going to be looking at spinning and then next week we've got shoemaking and then after that we're going to switch gears in as more witchcraft related stuff as requested. So without further ado, I think it's probably a good idea just to jump right into this week's episode. Now, the common images of spinning in folklore reflect its status as both a craft and a form of industry, and most cultures do have a figure that's related to spinning, from North America Spider Woman to the Norns of the Norsemen, who we met last week in the weaving episode. And as Freya Lynn Close Hainsworth points out, spinning is actually our oldest textile skill, because if you think about it, being able to make rudimentary string is what leads to both tools and clothing. So if you think all the way back to like Neolithic man needing to be able to make fishing nets and so on. It's basically, you can't do that without being able to spin. And you should bear in mind that the spinning wheels that we might think of today are actually a relatively modern invention. And the first wheels did appear in around about 1200, but the modern wheels that you probably see in folk museums and craft museums and so on only really appeared in the 18th century. You don't actually need a wheel to do any spinning. You can do what's called drop spinning, which uses like a drop spindle. And that is really, really hard. I have actually had a go at that before. And it's, I find it's easier than using a wheel because I couldn't get the hang of my two hands doing two separate things and then my foot doing something else as well. That was just too much going on at the same time for my liking. But drop spinning is still quite hard. It's trying to get an even thickness of the yarn is actually quite difficult. But which tales or figures most often deal with spinning and why is it such a common motif? These are the things that we're going to be having a look at in this week's episode. And it only seems fair to start with the big one, as it were, and that's the three fates. Now, I was torn between including the fates of both Greek and Roman mythology in last week's episode on weaving, but then I thought actually this is probably a better place for them to go. Now in both cultures they had this idea of three fates and not even the gods could change whatever the fates decreed for them. So much like the Norns in Norse mythology, these three figures essentially hold supreme power even over deities like Zeus or Jupiter. Now the first fate is Clotho and she spun the thread that became an individual's life. Her sister Lachesis measures the thread and then Atropos, who gives her name both to Deadly Nightshade and the Death's Head Hawk Moth, then cuts the thread. So the reason for potentially including them with weaving is that some of the myths actually have Lachesis weaving the thread into a tapestry so it's not just measuring it out. And I did actually borrow that particular slant for a short story about the fates and weaving and the link to that is in the show notes below. But the fates essentially fit better among these tales about spinning because of this concept of the fates spinning out our destiny, which really underlines the creation aspect of spinning. I mean, weaving's all about creating as well, but spinning kind of makes it a bit more obvious with this sense of you start with raw material and then through your intervention, you turn it into something that you can use for something else. Now, most people are concerned with what happens during the life, which is Lachesis' handiwork, or when it will end, thanks for that Atropos. But Clotho becomes equally important because she's essentially spinning the life into being in the first place with her cosmic spindle. 
Now, other cultures do also feature spinning deities and Frigg is the Norse patron of spinners and St Catherine is the patron saint of spinners as well. But spinning is perhaps more associated with the world of fairy tales than other crafts are. And that's why we're going to kind of bounce away from the three fates because there's not really a huge amount to say about them other than that's their link to spinning. And the first fairy tale that we're going to have a look at does indeed feature three figures, much like the fates or the norns. And this is a Norwegian folktale called The Three Ants. It does appear in other cultures as well, often known as The Three Spinners. And variations depend on the region it comes from and also the era. But I'm going to relate the version from the complete and original Norwegian folktales of Asbjørnsen and Mo. And in this version, a young girl manages to land herself a job as a maid at a palace. And she becomes a favourite of the queen. By all accounts, she seems like she's quite lovely and easy to get on with. And the other maids become jealous of her because she's good at her job and she's also a favourite of the Queen. So they then tell the Queen that the girl boasted she could spin a pound of flax in a day. The Queen is impressed and thinks, oh, okay then, if that's what you can do, go on. And she gives the girl a room on her own, a spinning wheel and the flax. Once she's alone, the girl goes into a panic because she doesn't actually know how to spin, let alone spinning a pound of flax in a day. At this point, an old woman wanders in and asks why she's so upset. So the girl tells her, and the woman offers to do the spinning for her. The only condition is that the girl should name her as an aunt on her wedding day. The girl agrees because it seems like a fairly straightforward condition, and the old woman spins the flax. The queen is overjoyed that her favourite's been able to do what she said she could, and the other maids are furious because this was not exactly how they planned it to go. So they then claim that the girl has also boasted about her weaving and sewing abilities, and again she's left first with a loom and then with whatever she needs to do with the sewing. Each time she's left to do the work and a different old woman comes in to do it for her and all she has to do is say that the old woman is her aunt. And the queen is so impressed with all these things that the girl can apparently do that she actually lets her marry her son, the prince. And she also then says, oh, well, you'll be able to do all the spinning, weaving and sewing. So the girl's like, oh, this is going to be fun. But anyway, on their wedding day, the three old women turn up and they say, This girl is our niece and the girl, true to her word, says, yes, these women are my aunts. So she keeps her word and everyone is horrified because the old women are apparently very ugly. And eventually the prince actually loses it and asks how she can be so lovely while they're so vile. And this is basically the clever bit because each old woman promises that she too was once young and fair. But all of her time spent spinning, weaving or sewing has left her looking this way. The prince is horrified that his beautiful bride might end up looking like that too, so he decrees that the girl will never have to do any of these tasks again as long as she lives. Hooray! That one worked out quite well for her, didn't it? A similar tale is actually told on both sides of the Anglo-Scottish border, except in this case the three ants become a single figure, the fairy known as Habitrot. And again, the hapless girl is saved from expectations about her crafting prowess by Habitrot's appearance at her wedding. And it's quite interesting in both of these versions that the girl actually goes along with what they say and ends up getting the big prize at the end of the day. And you may think, hang on a minute, that does sound a little bit similar. And the tale of the three ants is basically an inverted version of Rumpelstiltskin, which was presented by the Brothers Grimm. And in this more famous tale, the eponymous creature does the spinning for our hapless heroine. In this case, however, he actually demands her firstborn as payment and only guessing his name can render the bargain null and void. At least that's the version that we commonly hear. Jack Zipes relates an earlier version. And in this tale, the maiden can only spin flax into gold. She can't turn into yarn. And Rumpenstunchen, as he is known here, arranges for the prince to ride by and take her as his bride. And again, the price is her firstborn. Once she has a child, she doesn't exactly want to hand him over. And her maid overhears Rumpenstunchen so that when it comes time to guess his name, the queen knows which name to give. Now, both of these tales hint at a common theme in these spinning related stories, and that's the help from a god or supernatural creature to help finish an impossible spinning task. Now, in the grim version of Rumpelstiltskin, the woman tricks her helper and never actually pays the price. By comparison, the heroine of the three ants upholds the bargain and they, in in their turn, trick everyone else. And she's also forbidden from doing the one thing she can't do in the first place, which is quite helpful. 
But then in Rump and Stunchion, the Queen tricks her helper, but he never actually helped her with the spinning, and she held that power herself to turn flax into actual gold. And what's weird is the fact that this was deemed less valuable than yarn. So her inability to produce a useful textile raw material means that she's only fit to marry a prince, and the helper's only job here is to throw the prince in her path, and then he's denied the price that she originally agreed to. So whichever way you look at it, spinning eventually becomes aligned with trickery of one form or another. Now, the trickery is never really perpetrated by the actual spinner, but rather the woman associated with it, and spinning was already viewed as a woman's craft. The stick that held the unspun wool or flax was called the distaff, and the female side of the family was often referred to as the distaff side. And in the medieval period, even Eve was associated with spinning, although this doesn't actually appear in the book of Genesis. But this might be why the spinning wheel becomes the 13th fairy's weapon of choice in Sleeping Beauty. The fairy who becomes Maleficent in the Disney retelling chooses the symbol of female labour for the young princess who, let's be honest, will never need to work a day in her life. Or perhaps she chooses it because it was so ubiquitous and therefore it would be quite difficult for Briar Rose to avoid seeing a spinning wheel. I did always wonder exactly how anybody continued to make crafts or fabric or anything when King Stefan ordered that all the spinning wheels in the kingdom should be burnt. I mean, that seems like a bit of an odd way of going about it. And you do wonder, well, how did they continue to do anything? But, you know, it's one of many unanswered questions about Disney films. Anyway, we can't really go any further talking about spinning and spinning as a woman's craft without raising the somewhat misunderstood spectre of the spinster. And at its root, the word basically means a woman who spins. And the dictionary defines the term as applying to women who haven't married. But M. Strauss Knoll points out that spinster and bachelor aren't actually equivalent terms because the former is nearly always applied in a negative sense, while bachelors are almost celebrated for their single status. Now, part of the reason is that women were expected to marry and leave the workforce, so there was no real reason to offer incentives such as promotions or pay rises to working women because they weren't really expected to be in the job long enough. But here's the problem, and this is where it then relates to spinning in folklore. The fairy tales show how desirable others found the ability to spin in a woman. So women even land high-profile husbands because he thinks she can spin. Ironically, they're also expected to stop spinning because they've married. So they have to be able to do a thing to get a prince, but then when they get the prince, they have to stop doing the thing. It's a bit of a conundrum, but there we go. This is fairy tales for you. Now, the spinning in these stories should eventually be left to the old woman or the supernatural creatures, those who do the actual work in the first place, while the young woman frets about not being able to. And this is where the Rumpen's Junction version is an interesting one because of the fact that she absolutely can do the spinning. It's just for some reason she can only spin gold, not yarn, which you would think would be quite a useful talent to have. And I would imagine a prince would probably view that one quite highly. But indeed, an old German superstition warned men who encountered a woman spinning to turn around and find a different route. And you can only assume that this is because she would be a spinster and apt to try and trap him into marriage. I did read somewhere that the word spinster did actually eventually apply to a woman who could essentially name a price and it was chosen as an occupation that was still quite respectable because obviously it involves a certain degree of skill but she could then be independent and have her own form of income and it was actually it's kind of got more powerful connotations than most people give it but I absolutely couldn't find it while I was actually looking when I was doing this episode so you can take it whichever way you want. I prefer the empowered woman of independent means meaning of the word, but I think most people will still see it as a woman who never managed to marry, not that she didn't choose to, but that she couldn't find a husband. And that is why it sucks, in my opinion. But anyway, why is there so much spinning in folklore then? Because we've looked at all these different tales, why is spinning so important? Now, Julius Ernest Heuscher explains that spinning wheels, and I quote, usually symbolise inner creative processes shaping a natural product into something entirely new, end quote. And Rumpelstiltskin would be an obvious example here where straw becomes literal gold. There is probably a metaphor in here about the value of a person's labour being considered greater than the person themselves, but that lies beyond the scope of this episode. But it does also refer back to the idea of the fates who spin a person's life into being, and the turning of their wheel even references the natural cycles of life. 
Hoysha also refers to spinning as showing control of thinking and in this way spinning provides an opportunity for meditation of sorts and where weaving is an active form of creativity that requires input from the weaver to create the images, spinning is more passive so it requires a degree of focus and skill but less overt imagination. So as a result, it's possible that people would gather in a communal way while spinning took place and people might even tell stories while they worked so it's hardly surprising that we spin a yarn when we tell a story. Ultimately, I think it comes down to this idea of taking one thing, in this case raw wool or flax, and turning it into something that can then be useful. So it's creative, but it's also providing something of value and it's adding something additional to the community at large, in the sense of obviously these textiles that can then be used for other things. I think that's one of the reasons why spinning becomes so important and why it's so valued in the women in the folktales, the fact that they can take one thing and turn it into something else that is quite a desirable skill set to have so i hope that you've enjoyed this episode and as i say we're going to look at shoemaking next week i think you can probably guess which folk tale we're going to have a look at there and then we're going to switch up a gear and change to witchcraft related stuff for june because why not we do have the summer solstice coming up in june so yeah if you've got any requests for other topics for obviously future months please do let me know you can tweet me you can email me all the gubbins are below for ways to get in touch with me and in the meantime i hope you have a fabulous week ahead and i will see you next week for our final episode in make a month cheerio thank you for listening to this week's episode i hope that you enjoyed it if you did feel free to subscribe using whichever podcast app it is that you prefer if you do use itunes if you could leave me a review that would be fab basically it just means itunes are more likely to recommend this to other people and if you're interested in more folklore please feel free to swing by my blog which is www.icsedgwick.com and that's sedgwick spelled s-e-d-g-w-i-c-k and you can find all of the links images and other bits and pieces that hopefully you enjoy so have an absolutely fab week ahead and i'll see you soon cheerio